Okay, so again today we are starting with two objectives. We're looking a lot at what depends on what in a problem situation. So our first objective is going to be identifying independent and dependent variables. And we recall that independent typically has an X and dependent has a Y. y. Yes, you got it right this time. <laughs> Here's my hint. Y depends on, and I'll, you'll see in our problems, if cost is involved at all, it's almost always going to be the dependent because money depends on something else. How many hours you work depends on how much money you, how much money you make depends on how many hours you work, right? Yeah. So how much money you pay depends on how many things you're buying. We'll be looking at problems like that and I want you to keep this Y depends on X in our heads. Second is this function notation. We're going to write equations in function notation today and evaluate them for given inputs. Okay? And we're just going to do some problems in the book together. So look on page 253 at number 3. 253, number 3. It's a table. Do you guys see it? Yes. Now, I'm always telling you guys I'm a visual, visual learner. I can't always see the pattern in a table that's written across like this one in our book. But when we have tables that are written like this, if I rewrite it into this form, I start to see the pattern. And our directions here are asking us to come up with what the rule is and write an equation. What's happening with our x and y is what we need to ask. If I input a 1, my output is a negative 1. I'm already thinking how far apart are they on a number line. Two. two places. Let's see if that holds true for our second part because then we might begin to see that our rule might be minus two. Let's try two and zero. If I put in x and take away two, do I get one minus two is negative one? Two minus two is zero. What about three and one? Does that look like x minus two? Yeah. Yes. And our final one is four and two. two. What would happen if I put a five in there? Three. Three. Are we starting to see that the rule is x minus two? Yeah. And then to write the equation, we just throw a y in front of it. So the answer to three is y is equal to x minus two. Oh, well, this is all we do. Do you see how rewriting the xy pairs can help you start to see that what's happening when you put in the x to what comes out as the y? Let's try it with one that's a little bit more challenging for number four. Instead of a table, they've given us a set of ordered pairs. And again, if we put this in as x comma y in this format, we're going to start to see the rule here. Our first ordered pair is 1, 4. It could be plus 3. 2 and 7. Now we know it's not plus 3. Anybody have a guess at what the rule might be? Yeah. Times 3 plus 1 works with both of them, doesn't it? 3 times 1 plus 1. 3 times 2 plus 1. And then, Serenity, are you getting this down? Yeah. 3 and if this, if this rule is right, this should be a 10, right? Yeah. Because 3 times 2 plus 1 would be 10. And what's our final? 4 times 3 plus 1 would be? Check your ordered pair in the book. Are we on it? So we're going to have our rule is 3x plus 1. That makes the equation y equals 3x plus 1. Slope formula. It's that equation y equals mx plus b. We use it a lot when we're doing this kind of work. Yes? Oops, because I messed up. Thank you. Wait, what, what was it again? What the equation? y equals 3x plus no, 1. No, the other one that you said. Where I'm, oh, the y equals mx plus b? Yeah. Oh, isn't that what we did? Slope, yeah. right? Yeah. I remember Both that. of these equations are in that format. Okay. Who feels okay doing problems like this? There's going to be a couple in your work you're doing today. Excellent. 
Number five, it says identify the independent and dependent variables in the situation. Serenity? Yes, I Okay, are you doing this on your computer? Yeah. How? Okay, problem with that is you're not gonna be able to use it in algebra two. Okay, independent is usually X, dependent is usually Y. And remember we said at the very beginning, Y depends on X. I'm gonna read you a situation and you guys are gonna help me determine what is the X and what is the Y. A small bottle of water costs $1.99 and a large bottle of water costs $3.49 cost depends on the size of the bottle. Number six, we're looking again for independent and dependent. I often fill in dependent first. It's easy to think about what here depends on the other part. What depends on what in an employee receives two vacation days for every month worked? Vacation depends on months worked. Can you guys picture the graph? Going across the bottom would be the months and going up the Y would be how many vacation days they've earned as they're going. Thumbs up on five and six. Given a, st a statement, you can say what depends on what, right? Let's try number seven. This is where it's going to get a little bit weird because we're switching into function notation. Number seven says an air conditioning technici technician charges customers $75 per hour. Independent, dependent. The cost you're going to pay depends on the hours that you hire them to work. But now we need to write an equation for it. Can I make hours H as my variable instead of X? Sure. Yeah. They're variables, right? We can change it. This dependent is my Y. But we're going to make it that fancy version of Y and do function of H. If I was going to write this as a y equation, you guys would say the output depends on $75 per hour. And that makes sense, doesn't it? It's easy in our heads to switch from h to from h and x back and forth. I could have written this as 75 times x and you guys would have known, but we've said that the hours is going to be an h variable, so I just rewrote it with an h. Does that make sense? Now we're just going to change the y to be function of hours. My output is going to depend on how many hours I multiply times 75. Again, it's just a fancier way of writing our output. We can call it output, we can call it y, we can also call it a function of the input. The input is the h. And if I put two here, we would put a two here and it would be $150. And we're gonna do that in our next examples. Let's try another one, let's try number eight. An ice rink charges $3.50 for skates and $1.25 per hour. Independent, dependent. The total cost depends on two things this time, doesn't it? The independent variable is going to be the hours spent. So that's going to be hours. But the equation is going to be $1.25 times the hours plus the fee. unless you're one of those fancy people like my cousin who has her own skates. 
Now she likes having her own. And they're more expensive, so it's not cheap. Okay, I could say this equals y, or I could put the y in front. But if I'm going to write this as a function, I'm going to put the function of the hours is equal to the rule, $1.25 times the hours plus the 350 fee. So it's literally just the same thing plus the it really is the same thing we've been doing. We're just doing it with this function notation to make it slightly fancier writing. Think about when you learned cursive instead of printing, right? Same words, they just look different. Same equation, it just looks different. We use it slightly differently, and I'll show you that in a minute, okay? Anybody want more examples of these, or are we good? Are we good? Everybody? Yeah. All right, let's look at number nine. This is when we're going to start using them, and you'll see the slight difference from when we've been doing this. It's not very different, so don't panic. <laughs> Number nine says, for f of x, please write the equation down, equals 7x plus 2. Find f of x when x equals 0 and when x equals 1. Okay, here's how we traditionally would do this. We would put x here we would put 7x plus 2 here. And what would we put over here? Y. And then we would put in 0 and 1, and we would fill this out as a table. When we're using function notation, we have another way we do that. We write, when the function is 0, then whenever there's an x in the equation, I'm going to plug a 0 in instead. This is saying when my input is zero, my output is going to be the result of this. Nobody told me I put an equal sign instead of a plus. This is why I usually record in the morning. I'm not so tired. What is seven times zero? Zero plus two equals two. That means when my input of this function is zero, my output is two. It would look like this in a table. Same thing, slightly different. You guys see the connection? What was the other value we were asked to evaluate for? One. So we're going to come back to this fancy way of writing y, and we're going to put, if my input is one, then my output is going to be seven times one plus two which is seven plus two, which is nine. We finish the equation by saying, when my input was one, by saying function of one equals nine. It's the same as if I put an input here, and I put seven times one plus two, nine. In these problems, you're not making up your inputs. They will tell you in the book what inputs to try, just like our book did with 0 and 1. I'm running out of room, so I'm going to flip my notebook to go over here. Actually, I'm not. That's really hard to read. If you have room on your facing page, it would be great if you did it there. If you still have room to work, keep going. We're going to do two more problems together wherever it fits. Number 11. I don't know why we do this. We often have function of x, which makes sense to me when we write it as f of x because it is a function of the input. This notation makes total sense to me as your math teacher who does not have a degree in math but has been teaching math for a long time. I don't know why, but they also use this and this. They change the variable for the function part of it. And if you look at number 11 in your book and number 10, they did that. It means the same thing. They, they usually just use F, G, and H. We're skipping 10 because I thought it looked pretty much like number 9, but 11 is a little bit different, so let's do 11 together because it has a fraction. And what do you guys do when you have fractions in your homework? You always ask me about them the next day. And I, yeah, I'm still never fond. So let's go ahead and use the notation that the book has, although we could change this to f of x if we wanted. h 
and t are the variables that they're using. For when I have a function and my variable is t, the equation here is one-third t minus 10. And they're asking us to use 27 and negative 15 as our two inputs. 27, negative 15. So we are going to rewrite this as h when its input is 27, the equation would be 1 third times 27 minus 10. Over here, when my input is negative 15, I would rewrite the same equation, but I'm going to put in the negative 15 wherever the t was. And we're going to say what our outputs would be for those two things. You don't need to rewrite this the entire time you're simplifying, but it should be in your answer line. So I'm going to say, well, what's one third of 27? 9, nine minus 10. What's 9 minus 10? Negative 1. And then I'm going to bring down my function. When my input was 27, my output was negative 1. Over here, one third of negative 15 is going to be what kind of 5? Negative. negative 5 minus 10 equals negative 15. So when my input was negative 15, guess what? My output was also negative, negative 15. So yeah. basically, so you when you're solving, you don't need to um, keep rewriting h. It's too much to write. But it is part of your answer, so you should make sure you bring that down at the very end. Or it won't Well, it's not using function notation. <clears throat> okay. I think it's just time to get some practice in now. And the problems I'm going to have you do look just like these. Oh, wait, number 12. I forgot number 12. One more, because it's different. Please take a look at number 12 in your book, because I'm going to read it out loud. It is our word problem we're doing together today. I know, everybody grumbles about word I problems. World, I just saw problem. Serenity's family feud that she put together about math, and word problems was the first thing people grumbled about. But think about it. Math in the real world is word problems, people. Me too. A construction company uses beams that are two, three, or four meters long. Guess what? That's our input. Our input is two, three, or four meters. The measure of each beam must be converted to centimeters. Write a function to describe the situation. Find the reasonable domain and range for the function. Okay, well here we go. What's, what's the action when you're converting from meters to centimeters? I'm multiplying by 100. So if we're going to call the input L for length, then our rule is going to be 100 times the length. They're giving us our input, which is 2 meters, 3 meters, 4 meters, and we're being asked to convert those lengths to centimeters. We're going to say then, instead of y, we're going to say function of l. We're going to say the function of the length is going to be 100 times that length. You used to write it like this. Same thing. We would just say that x equals the length there, right? Now, they gave us some lengths. Old way you guys would do this would be to make a table and put 3, 4, five in the table, and the rule is 100x, and you would just multiply those and you would get 300, 400, and 500. You can still do that. You don't have to rewrite all of these as these kinds of equations up here, especially if it's something as simple as times 100. Because what is the question really asking us? What is our domain and what is our range? 
and write an equation. Well, we wrote the equation here. What's our domain? Three, three, four, and we put it in that notation bracket. Three, four, five. What's our output? 300, which can also be called our range. 300, 400, 500. That's it. Okay? So, practice, which hopefully you can get done before class is over, is going to be on pages 253 to 254. And the problems are numbers 13 to 23. Oops. Questions, thoughts, comments? Emily, did one of my set games fall? Could one of you guys get it and put it up? Maybe put it on the cart instead. Mm -hmm. Who feels okay starting this? Okay, if you're shaky, that means You've got an idea, get in there and find out where the shakiness is and what you need support on, right? Ask questions instead of giving up. Start at the beginning. What's input, what's output? What's dependent on what? And then you'll start getting into the crazy F of X stuff. Just think of it as cursive and math, that's all it is. F of X is the same as Y. Did you guys see Mr. Christopher here at the, earlier? Yeah. yeah. They're going on these walkthroughs and they look for things like, does the can the students say what they're learning and why? I don't even know what they ask you, Serenity, but it's probably something like that. Yeah. He and I have had this debate for years that they want to have language objectives. And I'm like, math is a language. <laughs> and he's like, no, but you need a separate language objective to help them learn English. I'm like, no, I'm helping them learn math, which is a, its own language. I laugh because he was here when I was like, it's just basically the same thing written a different way. She was telling me to use one Proof. I'm right. Math is a language. It is. It is a language. Right? It is. It's a language of numbers. It is. The alphabet um, can be... A language numbers. is something that can communicate using a set of symbols. You know how I, I'll show you my sixth period one. This is how I get away with it. Oh. Here's the word. That's it. So Edward. It's true. They're doing word problems and putting them in tables and graphs. I've added language to this.